Dr. Matsidipso Moiti, you are the World Health Organization's Regional Director for Africa. You are joining us from Brazzaville in the Republic of the Congo. Thank you very much for um, uh, accepting our invitation. Can you uh, uh, maybe starting by um, uh, 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 giving us an update on the current situation with regard to the COVID-19 in Africa? Yes. Th thank you. First, thanks for having invited me to this uh, very important meeting. You know, Africa now has more than 600,000 cases with um, 13,000 uh, and more people having died. And there is mounting concern about the sharp rise in cases seen in some countries in the region in recent weeks. Uh, and that's partly because some of the lockdown measures are now being lifted by governments. And so that, uh, that uh, intervention is now being eased in, in many countries. Last week saw a 30% increase in the number of confirmed cases in the region on the previous week. The total number of deaths in Africa also surpassed the 11,308 lives lost during the West Africa Ebola outbreak, just to make a comparison, and the worst, which was the worst in recorded history. However, we see that cases and deaths are not evenly distributed between the countries. And in fact, five countries make up about three quarters of the cumulative cases in Africa. And these are very much uh, South Africa, and then also Algeria, Ghana, Nigeria, and Egypt. While those um, report in the highest numbers in the past few days are South Africa, Nigeria, Kenya, and Madagascar. Uh, South Africa, I think, really needs particular emphasis because it accounts for about half of the cumulative cases in the region and is now among the top 15 most affected countries globally with their cumulative cases outstripping countries which were once at the center of the pandemic like France. And the Minister of Health recently warned his fellow citizens that the COVID-19 storm was arriving and in fact had arrived in the country. We also see that community transmission, you know, where you can't trace that this was a contact or somebody came from another country, is now happening in over two thirds of the countries in the African region. However, in most countries, the bulk of cases are occurring within a few hotspots areas and it's really around the capital cities, mainly. For example, in, in South Africa, most new COVID-19 infections and deaths were reported from three provinces, uh, from the Western Cape, from the Eastern Cape and from Gauteng. That's the province where um, Johannesburg is to be found. In other countries, community transmission is mainly limited to the capital, as I said. So we don't have widespread geographic spread in most of the continent. Um, and, and then I think we have to talk about the positive side as well. Not all countries have experienced the same rapid growth and some have managed to prevent community transmission entirely. So for example, countries like uh, Seychelles, where we're very worried because of their heavy tourism and uh, boats and uh, ships, um, for, had been for weeks, for a couple of months, we're reporting zero cases and then restarting their fishing industry. There was a, a Spanish fishing vessel which docked there with some fisher people and then they suddenly uh, imported quite a number of cases. And Mauritius has, has only had six cases all imported in the past month. So there are some countries that are able to keep the situation in control. Thank you. For the, what do you expect to be the impact of COVID-19 on, on tourism and travel in Africa specifically? Mm. Well, the impact on tourism and travel in Africa has already been considerable. Uh, in the first four months of this year, international tourist arrivals to the African region fell by 35% apparently compared to 2019. So the sudden and unexpected drop in tourist arrivals has placed many millions of jobs at risk and threatens to roll back the progress made really in sustainable development. African airlines uh, apparently could lose um, about 6 billion US dollars of passenger revenue compared to 2019 and job losses in the aviation and related industries could grow to 3.1 million, um, half of the region's 6.2 million aviation related employment, according to IATA, the International Air Transport Association. So in the worst case scenario, international air traffic to Africa could see a 69%, so almost 70% drop 
in uh, international traffic capacity and an almost 60% decline in domestic capacity. And this is according to a, an analysis done by ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization. The economic shock to tourism and travel won't hit all countries in the region equally, clearly. Uh, tourism revenues are the lifeblood of many economies though in Africa, particularly the small islands uh, nations. I've just talked about the Seychelles and Mauritius where tourism has been estimated to account for 10% or more of the total GDP. So countries are taking measures to mitigate the impact of the downturn in tourism and, uh, and travel. We apparently, Kenya has already set aside a special fund to help the tourism se sector. And in Senegal, hard hit sectors like transport and tourism are to receive direct support. And South Africa has already made an additional fund available to assist the small and medium enterprises in the tourism and hospitality sector. So it's going to be significant. Okay, obviously everybody in the hospitality industry in Africa is, is trying to understand, trying to assess when uh, reasonably we can expect travel and tourism to restart in at least some or most of the African countries. What is your feedback on this? Yeah, so I, as I've already mentioned, the outbreak is unfolding at different speeds in different parts of the continent and the region. And then we know, we've seen that uh, the outbreaks can be highly localized and transmission patterns can vary a lot between and within countries. So it's difficult to point to a single reasonable restart date. And instead, we should expect governments and industry figures to adopt a dynamic approach to risk mitigation. Well, we know, it's already said that tourism is a very important sector in Africa and one that's quite diverse. And some destinations and activities will be able to resume more quickly than others. Uh, the precautions that we need to be adopted by an international hotel chain, for example, are going to vary significantly from, say, an ecologe, something which is in a more rural area where uh, you, you may expect that the virus may not be circulating intensely. So this too has to be, will be dynamic, it will be a localized and it will be a partial process. The decision to reopen borders and resume flights is one that can only be taken by national governments and before loosening the restrictions, countries need to be able to assess the epidemiological situation on the ground and to rapidly be able to detect and respond to any localized outbreaks or sudden spikes in infection. So their public health capacities need to be really up to speed in order to respond quickly uh, and so that people feel safe. That means uh, they have to have uh, testing, they have to have good surveillance, they have to have tracing system and the capacity to isolate those who are infected so that they don't pass on the virus. Before starting, restarting the travel and tourism industry, countries need to make sure that there is a comprehensive screening system in place at the points of entry and exit, as well as registration systems for international arrivals that are linked to the public health authorities. This was really important in helping African countries be able to trace who was sitting near whom in a plane when somebody was discovered to be infected. It is absolutely vital. So WHO has supported countries with guidance and with expertise and equipment as they've revamped, uh, ramped up these uh, critical public health capacities. In fact, we were just giving our final comments to our headquarters colleagues. WHO is about to release an updated version of the guidance on international travel. But yeah, so we've uh, also provided some thematic advice on salient topics. So it has to be really guided by data, guided by considerations of the capacity to control. And uh, I think really in a strong partnership with the travel and the hospitality industries as well. Okay, so I'm, 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 uh, <clears throat> I'm understanding that you said that WHO is working on the report as we speak uh, to provide some guidance to the hospitality industry. Yes, it's on a guideline that will advise countries. So of course we know countries want to reopen their economies, including tourism. How can you do this safely? What do you need to take into account? How, as you make your decisions, what precautions do you need to emphasize, etc.? cetera? Yeah. Do you have any idea when that guideline will be issued or made public? It's, I, I think it's, it's, it's at any moment. Yesterday, I was just saying to my, the focal point in headquarters, we're fine with this. I think the intention is really to release it in the next days, literally. 
So then how can the hospitality industry restore customer confidence? Because obviously it's very important for all the uh, um, all that industry to restore the customer customer confidence, right? Indeed. I think customers recognize that we are in uncharted territory. This is an experience we have never had before. And so understand that things won't return to exactly how they were last year when they went on their holiday, on their trip. The best way to restore customer confidence is by establishing trust. And this can be done by providing certainty and clear advice and guidance on how they can best keep themselves, their loved ones, and their communities safe. If people trust their governments and the tourism sector to keep them safe, then customer confidence will progressively be restored. Since the beginning of the outbreak, WHO has been working closely with the travel and tourism sectors and with governments, including sharing information on a regular basis, participating in technical networks and developing technical guidance, as I've referred to, and travel advice. I think it's very important for a potential traveler to a place to be informed, to know what has been the situation, how bad has it been in that country, in whatever locality in that country, and to be able to rely on um, the information that the government is setting up, sending out. Governments can restore customer and industry confidence by taking a dynamic approach to risk mitigation and reduce the risk of importing cases from global hotspots. For example, Kenya has announced the gradual reopening of tourism establishments and has expressed an interest in in bilateral tourism agreements and COVID-19 free certifications for East African countries. So governments need to be speaking to each other as well. So where those where people are traveling from and the destinations of people. Dr. Moeti, thank you very much. I know you are very busy. Thank you for everything you are, you are doing. Um, and uh, um, we will be looking forward to uh, the publication of that guideline dedicated to the uh, hospitality industry. Thank you again. No, thank you for having invited me.